brothers and sisters, for individuals preparing to come into full communion with the Catholic Church, the season of Lent is called the period of purification and enlightenment. It's a time of more intense spiritual preparation for receiving the sacraments at the Easter Vigil. On the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays of Lent, those preparing for baptism go through the scrutinies with their accompanying exorcisms. There are specific readings the church uses for these, which is why you will hear the cycle A readings for the scrutinies, even if we are in cycle B or C. Those who are already baptized do not have to go through these scrutinies because they have already received that which the rites are providing. Even though the community and the rest of those preparing to come into full communion with the church do not directly participate in the rites, it is still a time for spiritual recollection for them, for you, to prepare for the Paschal Mystery. For those of you who are married, think of it in terms of attending a wedding. Even though you can't go through the ceremony, attending gives you an opportunity to pray for the couple and to reflect on your own marriage and how you have lived out your vows and how you will continue to live. Now, when I use the term, or the church uses the terms like scrutinies and exorcisms, we might start imagining Hollywood's interpretation of the Inquisition. But that's wrong. According to the RCA Rights book, the purpose of these scrutinies is to uncover and then heal all that is weak, defective, or sinful in the hearts of the elect, and to bring out and strengthen all that is upright, strong, and good. The, these are celebrated in order to deliver the elect from the power of sin and Satan to protect them against temptation, and to give them strength in Christ. These are done within the Mass, in the presence of the community. We do this so that you can pray directly for and with them, so that they can see and feel your support of them, and so that you can be reminded of the power of your own baptism and what you are committed to as baptized Christians. The first scrutiny, which is the one we have today, focuses on Christ as the living water. In the first reading from Exodus, we see God the Father providing water for the Israelites at Meribah and Massah. In the song, we are exhorted to sing joyfully and to not harden our hearts as they did at Meribah and Manasseh. In the second reading from Romans, Paul tells us that the love of God has poured out into our hearts. In the gospel, we have the story of the woman at the well, where Jesus tells her that he is the living water. Now, when we proclaim the gospel, we have the choice of a long version and a short version. And the uh, short version was chosen for today. But there's a couple of passages that are left out that I think are important for understanding the purpose of today's rite. Sir, give me this water so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered and said to him, I do not have a husband. And Jesus answered her, you are right in saying I do not have a husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, in addition to these verses, I want to give you a little additional information that can help us to understand this story, and again, for the purpose of today. We have Jesus, a Jew, talking with a Samaritan woman. Jews and Samaritans did not freely interact. We have a woman talking with a man who is not of her immediate family or a close family friend. That was simply not done in that culture. We have a woman by herself at the well in the middle of the day. Women did not go to the well alone or during the hot part of the day. They went as a group for company and protection 
and they went in cooler morning or evening hours. We put all these pieces together and we get a fair picture of a woman who was an outcast in her own town and of a conversation that was very unusual. Remember that I said the purpose of a scrutiny is to uncover and then heal all that's weak, defective, or sinful, and to bring out and strengthen all that's upright, strong, and good. In the light of the noonday sun, this woman walked in spiritual darkness and with a soul thirst. I would speculate that she thirsted for love. Not to be unkind, but that culture, five husbands, and living with someone that's not her husband. That's a woman that's been hurting for a long time. Did you notice that Jesus did not shame or scold her? He spoke truth in love, and her life was changed. In the light of Christ, filled with his living water, the lives of the elect are also changed, as are ours. It is vital that you pray for the elect and those entering into full communion with the Catholic Church. This is the time of year they most come under attack because Satan doesn't want more good Catholics. I've been doing RSA for over 20 years, and unless you've worked it or gone through it, you have no idea what some of these people go through to come into full communion with the Catholic Church. And I wasn't going to tell any stories, but during the readings, there's one that just kept hitting me. It's a, it's a short story, but a number of years ago, we had a young man came through the RSA process. We had a different person who was the director, his name was Don Waskowitz. We went all through the process, and then there's a time during Lent that we go on a, an overnight retreat up in Prescott. And on Saturday night, we share our journey. And he stood up, and he shared something that nobody, including the director, had known. What got him into the RSA process was he was driving by one day, and he saw St. Timothy's. And he pulled in. And he came to the front desk and he said, is there anybody, sorry, is there anybody that can tell me about the church? And Dawn was in her office. And he went and talked with her. She explained about the RSA process. He started the process. Now we fast forward, we're on the Lenten retreat. And he gave us the peace that night that no one else had known. You see, he was driving by St. Timothy's on his way to commit suicide. And he prayed. And he asked God if there was one person that could give him a reason to stay around. St. Timothy's gave him that reason. All of this, though, leads to something that concerns me, and concerns me deeply, deeply. The rites are celebrated in order to deliver the elect from the power of sin and Satan. At the Easter Vigil, we will all do the profession of faith, and part of that is, do you reject Satan? And all his works. And all his empty promises. My concern, brothers and sisters, is that we have sissified Satan. I do not mean that we, under the inspiration of Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, have reduced Satan to an impotent, ineffective sissy, one who has one hoof in the realm of the mythical. What I mean is that through our own actions and thought processes, have come to think of him as impotent, ineffective sissy, one who has one hoof in the realm of the mystical. If you think I'm kidding, look at how we refer to him in our culture. We use him as a symbol of evil, but not truly horrible evil, more like the evil we might want to get away with if we were sure we wouldn't get caught. 
you know, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We use them as a mascot for schools. We have the Diablo Stadium in Tempe. Really? The Devil Stadium. And you might respond with, Deacon, those are just names. They don't really have anything to do with Satan. Names are important. In a way, I won't disagree with you. I ate my share of devil's food cake growing up. <laughs> and I can still get into a really good deviled egg. But if names aren't important, why don't we have the, the God Superdome? The Yahweh Sports Complex? How about the Allah Arena? We don't name secular places after the sacred because we know that the sacred is sacred and not to be used for cute commercialism. Now, I'm not trying to start a groundswell movement to get ASU to change your mascot <laughs> or the name of the Tempe Stadium. I'm just trying to show how our naming conventions can indicate our lack of awareness about the reality of Satan. I think Archbishop Fulton Sheen has provided us with a keen insight into Satan, and this is a quote. Do not mock the Gospels and say that there is no Satan. Evil is true, real in the world to say that. Do not say the idea of Satan is dead and gone. Satan never gains so many cohorts as when, in his shrewdness, he spreads the rumor that he is long since dead. Do not reject the Gospel because it says the Savior is tempted. Satan always tempts the pure. The others are already his. Satan stations more devils on monastery walls than in dens of iniquity, for the latter offer no resistance. Do not say it is absurd that Satan should appear to our Lord, for Satan must always come close to the godly and the strong. The others succumb from a distance. End quote. Sacred scripture tells us, be sober, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith. By way of analogy, I want to offer the story of an event that took place recently here in the valley. In Litchfield Park is the, world, is the wildlife world zoo. There's a lady who wanted a picture of a jaguar. There is a barrier and a cage between her and the jaguar. She reached over the barrier to take the picture and the jaguar reached to the fence and nailed her arm. One report was that the jaguar was holding her arm against the fence and other patrons had to distract the cat. She later said that she never expected the jaguar would be able to get its big paws through the small holes in the fence. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Does that mean we have to walk around being afraid of Satan? No. As my spiritual director likes to remind me, Satan has no power over us if we walk by faith in the light of Christ. Walking by faith means staying on the proper side of the barrier. Lean over the barrier to take a photo as analogous to the near occasion of sin. You can get clawed. One final thought. Thinking that Satan is like Sparky the Sun Devil is about as accurate as thinking the live jaguar is like the stuffed ones in the gift shop. The real danger is that one can take your body, but the other can take your soul. Do you reject Satan? I do. And all his works? I do. And all his empty promises? I do. Amen.